the standard household alkaline battery. We use these every day all over the world, but how do they work? That's what we'll be covering in this video, which is sponsored by Squarespace. Head to squarespace.com to start your free trial or use code engineeringmindset to save 10% on websites and domains. A battery is a device used to store energy for a later point when we need it. We use batteries to power small electrical devices such as a flashlight. The energy is stored as chemical energy and this can be turned into electrical energy for when we need it. If we look at a simple battery and lamp circuit, to illuminate the lamp, we need lots of electrons to flow through it. The battery is going to provide the pushing force which allows electrons to flow through the lamp. We simply need to connect the lamp across the positive and negative terminals of the battery to complete the circuit. The battery can only push the electrons for a certain amount of time though. This time depends on how much energy is stored inside the battery and how much is demanded by the load. When we talk about load in an electrical circuit, we mean any component which requires electricity to work. These could be things such as resistors, LEDs, DC motors, or even entire circuit boards. Some batteries can be recharged, and it will clearly state this on the side of the battery. But the typical household alkaline battery can't, so this is simply disposed of when it runs out of energy. These can be recycled though, so do ensure you dispose of these responsibly. By the way, if you want to learn how a DC motor works, then we've covered that in great detail previously. Do check that out, links in the video description down below. A typical 1.5 volt alkaline battery looks something like this, but the colors will vary by manufacturer. When we look at a battery, we usually have a plastic wrapper fitted tightly to the outside. This will insulate the battery, but also tell us important information such as the capacity and the voltage, as well as which end is positive and negative. The positive end is known as the cathode, and it will have this extended surface which protrudes outwards. The negative end is known as the anode. These two terminals are electrically isolated from each other. Under the wrapper, we find the main casing, which is usually made from steel with a nickel plating. This holds all the internal components in place and stops them from interacting with elements of the atmosphere, such as air and water. Within the casing, we have multiple layers of different materials. These materials are specially selected because their chemical reactions create certain levels of voltage and current. The first layer is the anode, which is a mixture of manganese oxide and graphite. The graphite is added to improve the conductivity of the mixture and increases the energy density. Next, we find a layer of porous material, typically a fibrous paper which forms a barrier. The barrier prevents the anode and cathode materials from having direct contact with each other. This helps the battery last longer when it's not being used. If the barrier wasn't there, then the battery would short circuit. The microscopic holes within the material allows iron atoms to pass through it. Again, we'll look at that in detail a little later in this video. An electrolyte liquid of potassium hydroxide is then sprayed onto the separator during the manufacturing process. This will soak it and it will be absorbed into the anode material. The electrolyte used is an alkaline, which is why we refer to this type of battery as an alkaline battery. On the other side of the barrier, we have an anode, which is a paste made from zinc powder, as well as a gelling agent. The gelling agent just keeps the zinc suspended, so it doesn't accumulate in one spot. The zinc is in a powder form to increase the surface area of the material, which lowers the internal resistance and thus improves electron transfer. The steel capsule is sealed with a nylon plastic cap. A brass pin is then inserted into the zinc with a steel cap placed over this. This gives us the negative terminal. Notice that the positive and the negative terminals are separated by the plastic cap. This ensures they are electrically isolated from each other. Otherwise, electrons could flow through the casing to reach the positive terminal and short circuit the battery. We need to understand some fundamentals of how electricity works before we can understand the battery. Firstly, electricity is the flow of electrons in a circuit. Batteries can provide the pushing force that moves the electrons through the circuit. The electrons want to get back to their source, and they will immediately take any path that's possible to achieve that. By placing things such as lamps in the way of the electrons, 
we can force them to do work for us, such as illuminating the lamp. Batteries produce DC electricity, or direct current. This means the electrons flow in just one direction, from the negative to the positive. An oscilloscope will show DC as a flat line in the positive region. You can think of DC electricity like a river which flows in just one direction. In these animations, I show electron flow, which is from negative to positive, but you might be used to seeing conventional current, which is from positive to negative. Electron flow is what's actually occurring, but conventional current was the original theory which is still widely used and taught to this day. Just be aware of the two and which one we're using. The electricity you get from the power outlets in your homes provides AC electricity, or alternating current. This is different than the electricity provided by a battery. With alternating current, the electrons flow forwards and backwards continuously, much like the tide of the sea, which flows in and out between high tide and low tide. An oscilloscope will show AC as a wave running through both positive and negative regions because it's flowing forwards and backwards through positive and negative. If we look at a section of copper wire, inside the wire we find copper atoms. At the center of an atom, we have protons and neutrons. The protons are positively charged, and the neutrons are considered neutral, so they have no charge. Orbiting these are electrons. Electrons are negatively charged. Some of these electrons are free to move to other atoms. They will naturally move between other atoms, but in random directions, which is of no use to us. We need electrons to flow in the same direction, and we can do that by providing a voltage difference from a power source, such as a battery. When we talk about atoms, you will usually hear the term ion used. An ion is just an atom which has an unequal amount of electrons or protons. An atom has a neutral charge when it has the same number of protons and electrons, because the protons are positively charged and the electrons are negatively charged so they balance out. If an atom has more electrons than protons, then it's a negative ion. If the atom has more protons than electrons, then it's a positive ion. Voltage is like pressure in a water tank. To know how much pressure we have, we must compare the pressure inside the pipe to the pressure outside, and we use a pressure gauge to do that. When it comes to voltage, we use a voltmeter to measure the difference in voltage between two different points. If we measure the difference across a battery, we get 1.5 volts. But if we were to measure the same end, then we would get 0 volts, because it's the same end, so there's no difference. Some materials allow electrons to pass through easily. These are known as conductors. Copper and most metals are examples of this. Other materials do not allow electrons to pass through. These are known as insulators. Rubber and most plastics are examples of this. That's why we use copper wires with rubber insulation. The copper transports the electricity to where we need it, and the rubber keeps us safe. By mixing certain materials together, we can cause chemical reactions. This is when the atoms of one material interact with the atoms of another. During this interaction, atoms will bond together or break apart. Electrons can also be captured or released by atoms during the chemical reaction. OK, now that we have the basics covered, let's have a look inside the battery and see how it works. Remember we talked briefly about atoms. Well, all these different materials inside the battery are made from lots of different atoms tightly packed together. These are represented by the coloured balls, and each colour represents a different material and therefore a different atom. When we combine all these materials together inside the capsule, we're going to get a small chemical reaction where the atoms start to interact with each other. First of all, a hydroxide iron atom within the electrolyte is going to join with a zinc atom inside the anode section. This chemical reaction is known as oxidation and will create zinc hydroxide. As the zinc and hydroxide combine, it will release electrons. These electrons are now free to move and they will collect on the brass pin. At the same time, a manganese oxide atom is going to join with a water molecule from the electrolyte, as well as a free electron, in a chemical reaction known as reduction. During the chemical reaction, the manganese oxide turns into a slightly different version of manganese oxide. 
This version no longer needs a hydroxide iron atom, so it will eject this into the electrolyte. The water atom is replaced by the one ejected from the oxidation reaction. The hydroxide iron is now free and able to pass through the separator. So, as you can see, we have a buildup of electrons at the negative terminal. As the electrons are negatively charged, we now have more electrons at the negative terminal compared to the positive, which means we have a voltage difference between the two ends, and we can measure that difference with a multimeter. Remember, we can only measure the difference in voltage between two different points. Electrons repel each other and want to move to a region with less electrons. The positive region has less electrons, so they will try to reach this terminal. The separator prevents them from flowing inside the battery to reach the positive terminal. Therefore, the electrons need another route. If we provide the electrons with an external path, such as a wire, the electrons will flow through this to get to the positive terminal. By placing things such as a lamp in the way of these electrons, the electrons will have to pass through this and so we get them to do work for us, such as illuminating the lamp. As long as we have a complete circuit between the terminals, the chemical reaction will keep occurring, and the electrons will flow from the negative terminal. If we remove the wire or break the circuit, then the chemical reaction stops. So, let's recap on the chemical reaction that's occurring. The free electrons are entering the battery through the positive terminal. This combines with a manganese oxide and a water molecule at the cathode, which releases a hydroxide ion into the electrolyte. The hydroxide ion passes through the separator and joins with a zinc atom to create zinc hydroxide. And as this happens, electrons and a water molecule are released. The electrons want to get to a region with less electrons. The positive terminal has less electrons, so they will flow through the wire to reach this. And so the chemical reaction repeats again and again continuously. However, there's only a certain amount of material inside the battery, so over time this is going to become harder and harder for the chemical reaction to continue, and eventually no more electrons will flow. At this point, the battery will be of no further use, and it will have to be disposed of. We can use a battery to power some components, but usually a single battery isn't enough to power our devices. For this, we need to combine the batteries. We can connect batteries in two different ways, series or parallel. We have covered these circuit types in great detail previously. Do check those out, links can be found in the video description down below. When we connect the batteries in series, the voltage of each battery is added together. So two 1.5 volt batteries gives us three volts, and three batteries gives us 4.5 volts. The actual voltage might be slightly different in the real world. The voltage increases because each battery is boosting the electrons that enter it, so we get a higher voltage. If we connect the batteries in parallel, then we only get 1.5 volts regardless of how many we connect together. That's because the path merges at the supply, but splits at the return, so the electrons will not be boosted. However, this configuration type will be able to provide more current and it will also have a larger capacity, so we can power something for longer. For example, if the battery had a capacity of 1,200 milliamp hours, and we place two in parallel, then we will have a capacity of 2,400 milliamp hours, but a voltage of only 1.5 volts. If we wire them in series, we now have a capacity of just 1,200 milliamp hours, but a voltage of three volts. We use batteries to power our circuits. But how long can a battery power our circuit for? When we look at the packaging or data sheet for a battery, we see a value with the letters MAH next to it. This is the milliamp hour rating. For example, this one has a rating of 2,500 milliamp hours. That tells us it could theoretically provide a current of 2,500 milliamps for one hour. Or, 1,250 milliamps for two hours, or 20 milliamps for 125 hours. However, in real life, it probably won't actually last this long because the chemical reaction slows 
so the internal resistance of the battery changes as it empties. There are lots of other things that affect this, such as the age and the temperature. There's no real way to precisely calculate the lifespan. The best way is to simply test it. We can, however, make an estimate of the lifespan with the following formula. The battery life equals the capacity in milliamp hours divided by the circuit current in milliamps. So, for example, in this circuit, we calculate a demand of 19 milliamps, and the battery has a capacity of 3000 milliamp hours. So, 3000 divided by 19 gives us 157.9 hours. But this really is the best case scenario, though, and in reality, it almost certainly won't achieve this. We have also built a free, simple calculator on our website where you can estimate the runtime of a battery, as well as the required capacity. Do check that out, links can be found in the video description down below. To measure the voltage, we simply need to select the DC function on our multimeter, and then we connect the red lead to the positive terminal and the black lead to the negative. This will give us a voltage reading. You can see that this battery is rated at 1.5 volts, but when we test it, we get 1.593 volts. The two values are close, but usually not the same. When the battery is dead or dying, we get a lower voltage. This one, for example, reads 1.07 volts, so it's completely dead. However, sometimes we could still get a voltage of around 1.5 volts, even if the battery is of no use. To fully test the battery, we need to test it under a load condition to check whether it's still useful. And for that, we need a resistor. So we take a resistor of around 100 ohms, but it doesn't have to be exactly this value though. We connect the resistor between our two probes. In this case, I've just used some crocodile clips to connect the resistor between the probes like this. This way, current will flow through the resistor and we can take a voltage reading as this occurs. If the battery is still good, then the voltage level will only drop slightly. For example, this battery has a rated voltage of 1.5 volts. With no load, it is 1.593 volts. With the resistor connected, we take a reading of 1.547 volts, so this battery is still good. However, this battery is also rated at 1.5 volts. When we take a measurement with no load, it oddly has a reading of exactly 1.5 volts. But when we connect the resistor, we can see that the voltage has dropped to 0.863 volts. So we know that this battery has run out of charge. But now that you are all charged up, check out squarespace.com to create your own online web presence, which is packed with features to empower individuals to launch, share, and promote their own projects. There's powerful blogging tools to showcase your project photos, videos, and progress updates. You can easily schedule appointments for classes and sessions with team members or clients through their inbuilt tools. And you can even collect payments or donations to help support your cause. Head to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com forward slash engineering mindset to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. Okay guys, that's it for this video, but to continue your learning, then check out one of the videos on screen now, and I'll catch you there for the next lesson. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, as well as theengineeringmindset.com.